we're live. Yes, I think we are. Hi, hi everybody. It's really nice to see you on the internet. Um, how's my sound? Tell me in the comments. Uh, my room is very echoey. Uh, funny story. Uh, so I moved to the UK, I guess three months ago now. Um, none of my furniture has arrived because obviously the docks are a disaster at the moment. So I am sitting in a very empty room. Um, I also, as you can hear, have quite a, a froggy voice at the moment. I have some mild symptoms, but I'm fine. Uh, yeah, and I'm super excited to hang out with you guys. Oh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, okay, a little bit of an echo. Uh, I'm going to try and talk more into the mic, and hopefully that'll make it better. Oh, God, yeah, please get me plants, dudes. I'm, ugh, I'm so bored of being in a completely boring box of room anyway hello um friends shit is wild um i don't think any of us uh could have anticipated that something like this would happen um all of us are having to learn how to change everything about how we live our lives uh very quickly um and i know that a lot of us are feeling quite overwhelmed i'm feeling quite overwhelmed at moments um but I have also been feeling really grateful for this position that I'm in and how I can still connect with uh, people on the internet. The internet is really great. I'm glad the internet exists while this is happening. Okay, so um, I just wanted to give a couple of disclaimers before we jump into this thing. The first and most important thing is that I am an idiot. Um, particularly, I am an idiot about health and public health and viruses. Um, don't ask me any questions about anything health related. I don't know. Um, the second thing is that I am not a professional financial advisor. I'm just someone who thinks and communicates and writes and talks a lot about how money works and basic principles. Um, if you want someone, Ooh, Ooh, shame. Sorry. I see that the echo is really bad. Hmm. I'm not actually sure how to fix that. Are there maybe two mics on? There could be. Sorry, one technical moment. Third thing I'm an idiot about is this piece of software because I've never used it before. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to fix the sound. Thank you for being patient, guys. Okay, here, change camera and mic. Yeah, no, I am on the right microphone. Sorry, guys, I don't think I can make the mic. Okay, sorry, guys, I don't think I can get the microphone any better than that. Um, and the third disclaimer, so not a, not a public health expert, not a financial advisor, and also not a fortune teller. Um, I think that the... Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> Haley, I'm laughing at you. That's very funny. Um, I think that all we know right now is that things are bad. Um, things will probably get worse, but no one knows how much worse they're going to get. And none of us can know how long things are going to be difficult for. Um, so I think the best that any of us can do is look after the, the zone of things that we can control. Um, bearing in mind that what we're going through economically might be and you know in lives and bodies in the real world um might be over in a couple of months but also might be something that we're still feeling the effects on for a couple of years afterwards economically so what i want to talk today about really is what are the things that you can do now that are in your control that will give you the best chance of getting through this and surviving it financially. Okay. Um, and obviously surviving it financially is only a very small piece of what we should be caring about right now, but I know it's on people's minds. Um, okay. So just how this is going to work. Um, I am going to be taking questions mostly. Um, so you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there should be a a little ask a question button. Five lovely people have already asked questions. I might invite you onto the screen with me to actually ask the question. Um, you can also chat in the chat, but I'm not going to be seeing questions in there because stuff goes up. So please use the ask a question feature if you want to ask questions. Um, and the other really important thing is that this webcast is entirely free, but 
I, if you if, if you find it valuable, please could I ask you to donate some money to the Solidarity Fund in lieu of paying tickets for this. Um, the best way to do that is by clicking the Donate to Solidarity button on the screen, which will take you to their website where you can see the EFT details. It's best for you to donate directly to them because then you can get a tax certificate and write it off, and that's nice. There'll be future future tax rebate for you. Um, if you feel lazy and you don't want to do an EFT, you can also click the donate button, which will pay, uh, you, you can use your credit card. That money will come to me. I will put it directly into the Solidarity Fund tomorrow morning. So you can also do that way if that's easier for you, but then you won't get the tax certificate. So rather do an EFT. Okay, uh, I'm going to start taking your questions. Um, if we run out of stuff to talk about. There are also kind of five general things I thought we could talk about. Um, the one is the importance of managing your cash runway, figuring out how many months you have in your emergency fund. Um, I know that a lot of a lot of you, even uh, people that I recognize, names I recognize, um, have had real disruptions to your income at the moment. Um, and I know that the big thing that everyone is really worried about is even those who haven't had an immediate impact, people who haven't been immediately retrenched or immediately sent on unpaid leave um, are in industries that might be disrupted more over the coming year and people are worried about losing their jobs. Um, so the one thing that I think we should chat about is what are the things you can do to manage your expenses in this period to try to hold on to as much of a cash buffer as you can in case that happens. I also want to talk about what to do if that has happened to you already. So what are the options in terms of insurance, in terms of grants um, that are available that you should be looking into? Um, we can chat about investments. I could, I've seen a lot of the questions are about investments, so we can start there if that's what you guys want to chat about. Uh, should you be buying the dip, as, as people say? Um, what should you be doing in this market? Um, and then we can also just chat about working from home. I work from home. Um, I have been for, for ages and I'm also day 18 into pretty intense quarantine now. So I, I have tips, friends, I have tips. Anyway, so we can do, talk about any of those topics if you want, uh, just ask them as questions and we can jump into them. Okay, I'm gonna take my first question. Uh, Mr. B, I'm gonna invite you onto screen if you don't mind. Uh, so you can ask your question yourself. It is the top ranked question right now. Let's just see if Mr. V accepts. No. Okay, Mr. V, I don't think wants to come on screen. That's fine. Uh, Mr. V's question was a two part question. Part one, how do you balance keeping cash versus using it for investing at this time? The emergency fund is okay. Uh, question two, did I already miss the bottom of the crash? <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about question two first. Oh, there you are. Hi, how's it going? Hello. Fine, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. How are you today? Yeah, not too bad. Lockdown, sitting at home. Yeah, it's, it's everyone else. you know, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of nice hanging out together in our, in our respective homes. Uh, yeah, do you want to, do you want to uh, ask your questions? Uh, yeah, so it was a case of, you know, so let's say you make the assumption that your emergency fund is all sorted. Um, I'm in the blessed position to be able to say that and um, sympathies out to, to people who, who, who are trying to get there. Um, mm -hmm. How do you balance saying that, you know what, I have some money on the side and I'm scared to drop it into my um, RA for the tax rebate because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Or do I put yeah. it into something different? Uh, that's 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 really what I'm worried about. Mm. And um, then I saw some reports, people saying, well, you know what, the dip is already passed and now everything is on the uptake because of the stimulus fund that they that the US gave. And, you know, so did I miss the bottom or, or not? Those that's, are great questions. Uh, Thank you. Those are great no questions. Problem. Okay, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna close your video. Nice. So be expected to be called on to the front of the class. Um, okay, so let's talk about the second part first. Have you already missed the bottom of the market? I don't know. No one knows. This is the thing. Um, the market is really volatile at the moment. It means it's moving up and down a lot. Um, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to fall further. 
Um, there's good arguments that it will fall further, but there are also good arguments that the market has already had its panic and this is the bottom. So therefore, here's what I suggest, do not try to make a guess about where that the bottom of that market is. Historically, people have been incredibly bad at doing that. Also, the market being at its bottom means what is the guess that everyone else playing that game is making at the same time? You can't, when you're playing on that kind of timing game, you're sort of, you entered into the trading world as opposed to the investing world where you're trying to make money on short-term movements. Um, historically, just trading is a zero-sum game. For every winner, there is a loser. Um, so, don't try and play that game and think that you will win because everyone else is trying to play the same game. So here's what I suggest in terms of market timing. Because it is a very volatile market at the moment, now is a good time where if you do want to be entering the market, you want to be phasing in your investments over time. And that's kind of a different way of diversifying because you're diversifying over time um, rather than just an asset class. You do also want to be diversifying in terms of asset class, which I'll talk about now. Um, so basically, I don't know where the, market, the bottom of the market is. Neither do you, neither does anyone. So if you have 10,000 Rand that you want to put in the market right now, I would suggest once a week go and make a small transaction because things are, things are wild right now. Um, on to the, the first part of the question, which is, let's say you do have a hefty emergency fund, is now a good time to be investing and what should you be investing in? The short answer is, it's a yes with an asterisk. Um, I think the first and most important thing to manage is your cash buffer right now. Um, so normally what I suggest is that people have between three and six months of a cash buffer before they start investing. Um, and, and also that people pay off their high interest debt first. So that's, um, anything with an interest rate of, I'd say about 10% or higher, sorry, not 10% or higher. Um, that's your home loan, uh, of like 15% or higher. Um, so if you paid off all your short-term debt and you have a comfortable cash buffer, then you want to be investing. Um, because of the uncertainty in the market and the possibility that we are going into a pretty hectic recession that might last for a while, I would say that you want to err more on the larger side of that cash buffer than you would normally. Um, but also you, you sort of need to make your own risk assessments about your industry um, how likely it is that you, your income might be disrupted in the next while and how long that might last for. Um, with those things in place, yes, it is a very good time to be investing. But um, it's a very good time to be investing in long-term assets that are very diversified. Um, I think everyone here, I'm assuming, knows that I'm a big fan personally of uh, really simple low fee index ETFs rather than trying to pick individual shares. Um, and it's never more true than right now. Um, the reality is that a lot of individual businesses, even quite big businesses, are likely to close their doors or fail or fundamentally go through a really, really tough time over the coming years. Um, so it's a very high risk thing to be picking individual shares at the moment. When you pick an individual share and you buy a piece of a specific company like Sassel, for example, the value of that share can go to zero. Whereas the value of an index can never go to zero. It never has, and it's unlikely to. The market may drop further. It might've bottomed already. The, the reality is it is very likely to get back to a strong position at some point. The trick is that that at some point might be five years away. I actually want to talk about, um, if I can get a little bit uh, technical, at the, just a little side note for those of you who are interested in investing particularly. Um, so I'm actually going to try and share my screen. Let's try and do this. I have some graphs for you guys. Sure, we're, we're trying things though. All right, let's go share screen. This might not work. Oh, look, Sam Faceception. That's not, oh, oh, I think I just created a singularity. I'm so sorry. Uh huh. Okay, cool, good, 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 good. I think 
Let me just check that you can see that. Yes, I think you can. Alrighty. Okay, so I just quickly want to show you some graphs. So investments. Um, over the long term, South African investments in equities have been the best performing type of thing that you can invest in, right? And that's over a very long period of time. So between 1900 and 2019, um, South African shares have grown by 7.2% a year above inflation. That's what real return means. And over any shorter period that you look at, that number could be quite different. But the longer period that you leave it, the more it's likely to go back to that average, right? Um, when you dig into, sorry, those are the global numbers if you're interested, but when you dig into individual years, um, those swings can be really quite alarmingly big as we are seeing now. So I wanna give you an example. So the worst year that the S&P 500, so that's the index of the 500 biggest companies in America, the worst year that the S&P 500 ever had was 1931. Um, we'll see what the end of this year looks like. <laughs> um, and in that year, the S&P 500 dropped by 43.34%. Um, there's never been a five-year period, though, that has dropped anything near that far. So the worst five-year period was the period that ended in 1932, which overall was minus 12%. Over 10 years, the worst you could have done was the 10 years before 2008, um, or up until 2008, where you would have lost 1.39% uh, on the stock market. So this is the thing, is that with shares, you really need to be thinking about, can could I leave this money for 10 years if I needed to? Because the losses that you're seeing in your portfolio right now are just paper losses. They're not real. You haven't actually lost that money. Um, Christian van Heerden from the Fat Wallet Show, who's a good friend and very, very clever and much better at explaining some things than I am, um, had a great analogy where she spoke about how um, your, your share price, you can think of it like you're selling something on Gumtree or on eBay and people are bidding for it. So you can try and sell a camera uh, and you can say you want, you know, you bought that camera for 500 bucks. Um, and someone could bid 10 Rand on your camera. And if you don't actually sell your camera for 10 Rand at that time, you haven't actually lost that other 490 Rand. You can wait until someone will offer you a better value for it. That's a good way to think of your shares. Right now, if you look at your share portfolio, it, it's dire probably. But if you don't actually sell those shares, you haven't really made lost any money. The thing, though, is that you sometimes need to hold on to them for quite a while before the market swings back around. And we just don't know how long the dip is going to last. It's worth looking as well at like the, oh, sorry, those headings are the wrong way around. Um, funnily enough, the best year that the S&P 500 ever had was 1933. So two years after the, the big stock market crash. And that's generally how things go is when it goes down, it'll fairly soon afterwards go up again. But it's also worth talking about the fact that there's this thing called the drawdown rule, which means that typically the stock market has to recover by a lot more than the amount it dropped by for your portfolio to be worth the same amount. And a good way to think about this is imagine you had 100 Rand invested and the stock market dropped by 80%. So then your portfolio would be worth 20 bucks. Okay. You're like, oh, oh no. Um, now the problem is if the stock market recovers and it recovers by 80% again, you haven't got a hundred Rand in your portfolio because you now only had 20 Rand to start with. So if the stock market goes up by 80% again, then you have 80% of 20 Rand, which is 16 Rand. So now you have 36 Rand in your portfolio. So the stock market, if it dropped 80% would then have to go up by 400% to get your 100 Rand investment back to 100 Rand. Whew, so that's the doom and gloom, guys. Stock market is wild right now. It might be wild for a while. The way that you handle this is you make sure that you are buying consistently through the dip. This is the weird thing is 
I'm sure you've you've heard these analogies, but it is it does make sense to also see the stock market as though it's on sale right now. Um, but you've just got to be more you've got to be quite careful at this moment. And it's okay that some people are kind of holding back because the market might dip further, right? That that does make sense. Um, if you have the stomach for it, though, the best thing to do when it comes to your investments is just stick to whatever plan you had before. Don't look at your investments right now. I haven't looked at my portfolio value in the last month. I don't want to know. <laughs> um, and if you were just buying shares consistently and ideally buying something very diversified like a global ETF, keep doing that if you can. Um, but if you want to pause for a couple of months and build up your cash buffer, that also is something that makes sense right now. Okay, that was a very long answer uh, to a complicated question. I hope I answered that question, Mr. B. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Since the global and South African economy. Oh, wait, Tayo, Tayo, you are here. So let me just invite you on the screen. Tayo, I'm going to invite you. Uh, you're welcome to come onto screen and ask your question in person. If you don't want to, that's fine. I will just ask myself and give you a second. Oh, guys, I'm very hoarse. It's cold. It's it's real. It's a real thing. Da, 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 da. Teo. Teo. No, I don't think Teo is going to join us. That's fine. Okay, so Teo asked, um, since the global and South African economy are on a free fall at the moment, would it be wiser for someone who's not close to retirement age to A, keep my current investment debit orders running? People are saying it's cheap now, so invest, invest, invest. B, pause debit orders and redirect the money into a fixed deposit or cash fund where deposit and returns are guaranteed. Or C, pause debit orders and buy 7,000 rolls of toilet paper. I mean, definitely C, definitely not C. I mean, I think at the moment it's buying 7,000 boxes of cigarettes and cartons of crates of wine, I think is everyone's real concern at the moment. Um, I think I've kind of answered that already. Um, I would say though, that it's really important to think about when you're gonna want that money. So at the moment, you should only be buying shares if you really are comfortable with potentially not being able to sell them for 10 years is what I would say. Um, if you need, if you think you are going to need that money earlier than that, then now is a good time to consider some kind of blended fund. Um, I personally would go for some kind of balanced, one of those balanced managed portfolios, um, or I would create my own out of low cost ETFs, um, rather than putting it purely in a, in a sort of fixed, fixed a return vehicle. I, I just think a lot of those um, you can you can get better better off better options than that. But yes, if you think you might need the money in three to five years, now is not a good time to be putting it in the stock market. Or in general, you wouldn't want it at any time, all in equities, because this can happen. Okay. Uh, yes, and don't stockpile toilet paper, please. Um, okay. Fabio, I think that's also a very similar question. Guys, I'm so proud of how many of you are like, yeah, you know, I got my whole emergency fund. We're all sorted. That's amazing. Um, okay, let's talk about Lance. Lance, I'm going to invite you on screen if you want to come on screen. It's a question about a money market fund. It's a bit different. I take it no, unless I'm just doing this wrong, which is also entirely possible. Guys, I'm an idiot, so I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Lance says, um, I've got my short to medium term savings in a money market account. Should I consider moving those funds? I'm not touching my long-term investments. Very wise to not touch your long-term investments. Um, a money market account is actually a really good place for short-term funds. Um, beyond the money that you would need in I'd say like a year to two years. Um, yeah, you should probably put it in something that'll get you a little bit more interest. Hello, Lance. Hello. How you doing? Hello. Hi. I can can't seem to hear you. Oh, no, that's a problem. Um, I 
Um, not sure if you can hear me, but my question was, my question, I can't actually hear you, but I'm going to go ahead. My question was specific to money market accounts. I've got my short to medium term savings currently in a money market account. Um, is that wise or should I move that to a different savings account? Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks, Sam. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to say thank you and goodbye to Lance. Okay, so note to self, I just need to give people more time to connect. Um, okay, so just to recap that, short-term savings, money market account is a great idea. Um, Medium-term, you could probably put it in something, you could diversify it a little bit and add some other things in there. Um, something that I have been considering for my medium-term uh like longer term cash buffer, I guess, um, that might be relevant to some of you, um, is I have been, dive, I've been putting some of my, a small amount of my medium term savings into foreign currencies. Um, that might be slightly specific to me because my, I have quite a global life. I have expenses in South Africa and expenses in the UK. Um, the I've been knocked a lot in the last sort of six months by currency fluctuations and the rand going up and down. Um, so even if I had expenses only in South Africa, something that you might want to consider is taking a small proportion of your medium term sa savings, uh, not your short term savings. Your short term savings probably money market South African rand is a good place for it to be, but medium term savings might be a good idea to use a product like Shift. Standard Bank's Forex uh, foreign currency buying and selling app um, and maybe try and add in some, uh, some other currencies. But it, at that point, like you definitely don't want to do that with too much of your money because there's a lot of risk in doing that as well. We don't know what's going to happen to any individual economy um, over the next year. So what I, I like to do because I can't tell the future is diversify as much as I can. Um, and something that I've been newly thinking about is diversifying when it comes to my cash savings as well. Um, yeah, but that is a very specific to your own situation kind of, kind of thing. So think about that one carefully. Okay, I want to ask David uh, if he wants to come on screen because I love David's question. Just going to see if David wants to join. Give David a second. I'm really glad someone asked this question. Cool. Okay, I think David is going to join us. Sorry, guys, this is very much an experiment. We will get slicker every time we do this. Okay, I don't know if David is going to come on screen. Okay, so I'm going to start asking David's question for him. Um, David says, hi, Sam, I'm a creative freelancer sitting with the situation of having lost a lot of work with not too much saved in my emergency account. So I've been feeling a bit of the brunt here. What would your suggestions be? I'm a bit confused about the various grants available and if they apply to freelancers. have heard conflicting opinions on that. Is there any financial support a guy in my position can apply for? Okay. So the unfortunate news is that there is it's there hasn't been enough clarity on this yet. Um, I have I'm a freelancer and I have a lot of friends who are freelancers. I know um, that it's a very stressful time. Um, and yeah, my thoughts are with you. It's it's just incredibly tough. I'm so sorry. Um, I will tell you what things um, to to watch um, as and wait for more information to be released. Um, okay, so insurance, and I'm actually just going to talk generally here about grants, but also insurance, because I think that there's, there might be some options that might be relevant to a few people. Um, okay, so the two main sort of grants that have been announced right now by the government, um, there's a, the Solidarity Fund is the big one. There's not a lot of information yet about how one will be able to apply for relief from that fund, who exactly will be able to. Um, at the moment, they're saying it's, it's for vulnerable 
you know, uh, people and, and businesses. So it's quite broad. Um, there's also a website called smmesa.gov.za. That's particularly for small businesses. Um, and not all small businesses are um, able to apply, but that's definitely something that you could apply for. And depending on what kind of freelancer you are, if you have registered as a small business, it might be worthwhile trying to apply for grants through that program as well. Um, I know that that website has already been flooded, though, and I know that there are thousands of people, no doubt, who have already um, applied. I think, unfortunately, this is the, the high level reality is that our government is, is doing a great job um, making plans, but the reality is that a lot of South Africans were already very economically vulnerable before this happened. And there are so many people who are going to need help that I personally think that it is smart to try to make plans, definitely apply for those grants, see if you can get access to them, but I think it's also down to all of us, unfortunately, to see how we can help ourselves, but also people in our own in our, in our communities around us as well. Um, I don't think you can count on any of these grants, and there's so little information that's come out yet. Um, I promise that as more information becomes available, I will post whatever I find. Um, some other things to think about, though. The UIF, the Unemployment Insurance Fund, has um, is offering special disaster relief COVID-related um, funding. The thing about the UIF, though, is that you your employer is the person who applies for the UIF uh, typically, um, and they need to have been contributing to the UIF on the employee's behalf. So it often isn't applicable to freelancers, unfortunately. Where this is really relevant um, for people to think about as well is that um, I have heard very sadly, and I find this very difficult to accept, but I have heard of people letting their domestic workers go or ask or sending them home on unpaid leave at the moment, which I think is something that we all need to be, if you have a domestic worker, I feel like that's paying them is something that you need to work really hard to do. They are going to go through a really tough time without um, being paid right now. But if you do have a domestic worker and your own income has been so badly affected that you really cannot pay them during this period, um, if you have been contributing to the UIF for them, which you should have been, um, you can apply for UIF funding for them. Um, and employees can apply for UIF funding at the moment, even if they're only not being paid during the during the shutdown. Um, so they've relaxed some of the rules, specifically taking into account what's happening here, what's happening right now. So that's an option. Um, the other thing uh, to think about is if you have income protection insurance, some people do. Um, there are various flavors of income protection insurance. There's uh, disability cover, some cover uh, for just retrenchment or periods where you're not working. Some of those policies, depending on what you have, will pay if your income has been affected right now over the coming period. Um, in some cases, they'll only pay if you actually do get sick, depending on what kind of cover you have and what, what it is covering. But if you have income, some kind of income protection policy, now is a good time to crack open that bad boy and see what the what the terms are and what you are actually covered for. Um, that's something to think about. Um, the other thing to look at as well is approaching the banks. Um, they they are coming under a lot of pressure at the moment to offer uh, credit holidays. Um, if you have a, a home loan, for example, um, you can talk to your bank about applying for a break in paying back your mortgage. Sometimes they offer three months. Um, sometimes they require you to restructure the payments afterwards. It can end up being more expensive over the lifetime of the loan, of course. But if you need immediate relief, um, also a really important piece of advice is to just proactively now contact any of the people that you owe money to um, and get ahead of the queue because you rather want to go and have a conversation with them now than in a couple of weeks' time when as more people are retrenched um, who are all going to apply for the same kind of relief. The banks are also considering um, 
other solutions like for example um there's a there are there's a move to ask the credit providers to allow credit life insurance to apply during this time uh normally you have credit life insurance on loans often on things like your car loan or your home loan that pay out if you die and sometimes also pay out if you're retrenched um it's a bit of a gray zone if you you know as to whether they should pay out if you can't work temporarily because of something like this um but those are that's also something to to look at and to approach your credit providers about um because that's something that the industry is also looking at Sure. So um, I think to bring that all together, um, I wish I had clearer answers for you right now, but unfortunately, this information is ha is being all of these questions are being decided right now, and more information will be released over the coming days. But I hope that gives you some ideas, at least, of um, things to watch and things to apply. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to the next question. All right. Okay, Devon. My mate just had his salary cut in half and was told this the day before his salary gets paid. Is this even legal? And what could I possibly say to advise him on this? Yo, that's really hard. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think that uh, labor law is definitely being tested at the moment. Normally, um, these kinds of, um, you know, salary reductions and things do need to be discussed with employees before they're just applied. Um, I would think I've, I've been retrenched before. And when we went through a retrenchment process, they do the consultation process where they, um, they have to offer solutions like cutting people's salaries, reducing their hours, trying people in different kinds of roles. Um, I think the reality is that a lot of businesses right now are just really confused and don't know what to do. Um, I don't know if that's legal, to be honest, or not. I, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in labor law. Um, I would certainly think, though, that that would be a case where your friend could try to apply to the UIF, depending on what their income level is. Um, the UIF often, um, you know, it, it kind of focuses on getting you up to minimum minimum wage, at least. Um, if the remaining salary is above that, I don't know if they would be able to apply for something like that. It's tough. It's just so, so tough. I'm sorry. Um, I don't have a clear a clear answer about the the legality of that just a lot of sympathy no okay lauren says hi sam please don't invite me onto screen i'm still in my pjs something i have been side note digression something i have been really enjoying about working from home is that i have been wearing all of my most ridiculous clothes every day not today because i knew you would all see me but i've been wearing literally my my costume party clothes and my ball gowns. I don't know why I have so many ball gowns. I really like ball gowns. Anyway, I've been swanning around the house like a Victorian countess having a ball. Highly recommend. Okay. Um, hi, Sam. Please don't invite me on screen. I'm still my DJs. I'm not contrib currently contributing to my RA or my TFSA as I'm doing pupillage and don't have any income. Would your advice be any different for people in my position? Should we just wait it out as well? Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about this. No, I mean, I think if you don't have any income right now, then your first priority is to when you do start earning, earning money, you know, or if you get a side hustle, but I, I have no people who've been through pupillage. I know the idea of a side hustle while doing pupillage, not an option, not a vibe. Um, but any income that does come in um, or when your income does start coming in, your first priority should be to build up an emergency fund um, just as for anyone. Um, and then thereafter to look at uh, contributing to a retirement annuity, very long term investment um, or some kind of investment for your retirement. Um, as far as I know, uh, advocates, uh, I assume it's, that's what you mean by pupillage, um, are all self-employed. So you would need to look at um, something like that. Uh, but yeah, no, my advice is pretty much the same, I think. Yeah, good good on you for thinking about these questions before earning an income and figuring out what your plan is. 
Uh, okay, next question. Boop, 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 boop. Boop, boop, boop. I'm interested in whether it is a terrible idea to buy a house at this time. <laughs> if you were, say, making an offer as the shit hit the fan. This is actually a question that has come up a couple of times that I have seen. Um, I do think it is potentially quite a strange time to be buying a house. Um, the reason is that it's a, it's the, the world's most undiversified investment, buying a house. Um, buying a house can be a great idea for people um, who plan to live in the same place uh, for a long time. Uh, more than nine years, typically, it's better to buy a house than to rent if you don't move. Um, but buying and selling a house in shorter, a shorter time period than that, typically you will lose money just because transfer fees in South Africa are very high. The reason I would say now is maybe like hold off a few months if you can um, is because the market, the, the where the kind of economic market is, tends to have a really large effect on what house prices do. Um, so you're likely to see the house, the housing market change quite a lot in the next few months, um, which might mean that you could get a better um, deal on a property if you find your dream home that you're very committed to staying in for a very long time. Could go the other way also. Who knows? Stock market is crazy right now. I'm not a, I'm not a fortune teller. Um, the, the thing is, though, it's likely to be volatile, um, which means that it's a, it's a bit of a difficult time to be making a, a kind of really intellectual, non-emotional decision about whether a house is a good deal financially. Um, and it's something that you are going to be locked into for a very long time. Um, that said, obviously the repo rate has just gone down. So uh, you'll get a slightly cheaper home loan, which is nice. Um, the other reason that I would be a little bit careful buying a house right now is obviously because um, people's incomes are at risk. Uh, over the coming year, I would be very wary locking myself into an expense, um, a large expense, probably my largest expense um, that I, I won't be able to control or move uh, for for a while. Um, but all of that said, um, if you are really committed to where, you know, wanting to live in a very specific area, you're feeling very secure about your income and you have a really healthy emergency fund um, of six months-ish, uh, then it's not a terrible idea to buy a house as long as it is, you know, it's part of your long-term plan. Um, but yeah, if you could, if you could wait a couple of months and just see how the market shakes out, maybe not a bad idea what I would say. But again, I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know what the housing market's going to do. Okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. I hope that was helpful. Okay. Nicole, what would you suggest to someone who's meant to be retiring this year and who was planning uh, to take the, fi the 500,000 Rand cash? I'm very concerned about my mum. Uh, second question. Okay. So let me take that first one. So firstly, just relate. <laughs> my mum uh, is retired and um, that's actually been one of my biggest financial stresses is just uh, trying to help her navigate what's happening. The thing is, for me, the stock market crashing is not that scary. I'm, I'm excited because it means I get to buy uh, index funds at prices that we last saw a year ago. And I'm like, yay, market's on sale. Get that stuff in there because I know I can wait 10 or 15 years before those stocks recover. In the case of people who are nearing retirement, who are already retired, they need to be drawing money out every year. And that is a very different situation. Um, the problem, of course, is that as soon as you draw money out of an investment portfolio, you are realizing those losses. You're turning those fake on paper money losses into real losses. So, you know, I'll just, I'll get really personal, but the conversations I've been having with my mum, my mum has had a, you know, a spike in uh, expenses recently. She's been quite worried about uh, the coronavirus and she's wanted to buy stuff like a big uh, deep freeze because she wants to stock it full of things. Um, 
it's very understandable. Um, and uh, so she actually wanted to pull extra money out of her retirement savings. Um, and I had a, a long conversation with her about why that was a really bad idea right now. Um, and what, luckily, I'm in the position where it's much easier for me to pull money out of my emergency savings and rather loan her that money. Loan, you know, I don't actually believe in lending money to family. I believe in giving money to family. But um, it's because I can, it's much, much better for me to give her that cash right now than for her to sell investments. Um, and I think that this is definitely a conversation that if you have older parents or if you are older, um, you want to be protecting that portfolio as much as possible. Now is not a good time to be drawing um, cash out of it. As to what's going to happen a year from now, it's hard to tell. Sorry, I can't remember. Did, she, did you say she was a year away? Um, yeah, but definitely you want to try to encourage people who are who are older, who um, are closer to retirement, who are retired. Now specifically is the time to not be drawing money out of that portfolio as far as possible. Um, that's the way that you can minimize uh, the 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 knock basically, um, and that might mean within families finding ways to support your parents. Um, through the next the next while more than the normal maybe um, to try to protect that long term nest egg. That said, though, it's worth remembering that even if you are sixty or seventy, um, depending on how healthy you are, you might still be looking at ten or twenty or thirty years of retirement. So hopefully, a lot of that will still recover. Um, it's difficult to tell. I, it will recover over a long period of time. It's obviously yeah. Uh, yes, so I would be very careful. It is a good time to have a conversation with your parents. Um, try to help them not have to pull money out of a retirement pot right now. Okay. All right. I hope that was helpful. And uh, let's go. Okay. I've got like 10 more minutes. Uh, I think it's time for another couple of questions. I hope this is helpful. Uh, okay. Oh, so Nicole had a second question. If I want to invest personally now, and I no usually do the Ashburton 1200, would you suggest continuing in this manner? I have quite a bit of cash sitting around. This is long term. Okay, great, Nicole. Uh, yeah, I love the Ashburton 1200. For anyone who doesn't know, um, the Ashburton 1200 is an example of a global index feeder ETF because finance bros give people things the worst names. Um, what it is, is it is a South African product, so you can put your rands into it, and Ashburton will then go and essentially buy shares in 1,200 companies around the world, all around the world. These products are great because it's so easy uh, to buy shares in just this one little ETF, and you automatically are diversifying your money into countries all around the world, um, into some of the world's biggest companies. And also the nice thing about ETFs is they're self-correcting because it's always the you know uh, companies that are qualified to be in the ETF. So a company that uh, becomes less valuable, that might be going through a tough time over the next couple of years, they'll just get, it'll fall out of the ETF and they'll buy something else. So ETFs are beautiful, I love them. The Ashburton 1200 is a specifically wonderful, lovely ETF. It has very low fees. Um, it's my second favorite local local ETF that is a global feeder fund. My favorite favorite is the Satrix MSCI World Fund. Um, they, the differences between this and the Ashburton are so tiny and nuanced. And if you're at the point where you're trying to decide between one or the other, either's fine, it's okay. <laughs> The Ashburton has slightly more developing market uh, countries in it than the Satrix MSCI. So people like it because um, some people believe that there'll be, you know, there'll be more growth out of uh, those, those uh, companies. But they're, they're very similar. I love the Ashburton. It's a great thing to be investing in right now. Um, yeah, keep doing that. It's rad. And again, whatever your strategy was, your investment strategy was before all of this started happening, just ignore the market and keep doing it, basically. But just remember, phase it in. Don't, don't, don't be making bets. Don't be trying to time things. Yeah. Okay, let's go to 
see if we have another question. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, Jeffrey. Hi, Sam. What do you think about the investment option Fed Group offers? 10% guaranteed interest rate, but must be over 100,000 Rand for a fixed five year period. I was offered this as an investment vehicle a few years ago. Initially, it was appealing. I subsequently chose not to go ahead and keep my money in a money market account for access if needed. Um, I'm always wary. Of, I say this ironically as someone who's just gone on a long rant about how much I love the Ashburton 1200. <laughs> I was going to say I'm, I'm usually quite wary about uh, making statements around very specific investment products. Um, but I, I recognize the irony in this and how much I've just failed at my own rule. Um, I generally am not a fan of uh, fixed term investments. I prefer money markets and money market funds, but it also depends a little bit on the timing. What I notice about uh, that product you say is that was the lock in five years. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't keep my money in a money market account if I wanted to keep it there for five years. So I don't think it's entirely reasonable to compare the Fed Group product to a pure money market account. Um, Yes, I would rather compare that to a sort of five-year five-year investment vehicle, which for me would be prop, like a very equities-heavy mix, which I would expect to do a little bit better than that. But it's more risky, so it's a little bit of a personal a personal risk assessment. But my instinct, as a general rule, I I am not a big fan of uh, fixed term fixed term investments. I think you can normally find better options. The only time it is really useful, though, that said, is if you have a very specific expense you are expecting and you are 100% sure about in that time period. Like, say, for example, you have a kid who you definitely want to send to a big expensive university in five years' time. Then, and you have no room for that money to be even a tiny bit at risk, then that might be worth considering in that kind of very specific case. And even then, I would probably balance that. I would put half of my money in something like that and half of it into uh, a different kind of investment vehicle personally. But that's the kind of question you should probably talk to uh, a financial advisor about as well. Okay, we have eight minutes left, guys. I'm going to take one or two more questions. Um, you can also vote for other people's questions, by the way, if you haven't seen that. So you are in control about what we discuss. Um, okay, so let's go. Uh, one more question from David uh, relating to ETFs and unit trusts. I have an amount at the moment in the old mutual global equity account. Would you say it's a good idea to move that out to a safer ETF or will pulling it out now making me lose out since the market is already in a dip? Yes, the latter. Don't touch your ETFs right now. Uh, now is not a good time. Um, if you decide uh, that it, that is not the best ETF for you, um, what I would suggest is just open a new ETF and any additional money you want to invest, put it into that new ETF and when things are less volatile, um, then I would start phasing phasing the money out of that old mutual global, global equity account into your new ETF uh, that you want. Um, but personally, I would really avoid doing that right now because uh, yes, as soon as, as soon as you sell the ETF, it's now that you are accepting the ten rand bid on your camera on Gumtree or eBay, right? So you don't want to accept that. You want to hold out for a better offer, probably. Unless you, yeah. And this is why you have an emergency fund, by the way. This is why. It's so that you never have to sell in a dip. This is why. Emergency funds are great. All right. Dumb question from Fabio. If, no, just such thing as dumb questions. If I choose to go with a higher equity unit trust fund, do the unit prices also fluctuate with the stock market? I just want to make sure I understand your question. Higher equity unit trust, yeah, uh, the unit prices, yes. Generally, if um, you have a unit trust and it has a lot of uh, equities in it, then yes, the price of your unit trust will go up and down based on the price of what's inside that unit trust. So yes, it would. 
Um, okay, cool. Quick question from Edric. Should I keep paying extra in my mortgage or invest more in the markets? Oh, so this is quite a nice thing, actually. So with the Reserve Bank having dropped the repo rate by 1%, if you do have a home loan and you are lucky in the very lucky, fortunate position where your income has not been disrupted and is unlikely to be, um, I highly, highly recommend don't reduce your home loan payments. Um, keep paying whatever you were paying if you have a, a variable um, a variable rate mortgage. Um, just keep paying whatever you were. Um, if you do that and you have a 20-year mortgage, 1%, paying an extra 1% every month can take four years-ish, I think, off uh, your home loan period. So that can have a huge impact, which is really great. You do always have to balance that against investing in the stock market. Um, it's quite a personal decision um, and it isn't purely about math. Some people, for some people, it's of enormous emotional benefit to not have that debt of the home loan in their lives anymore. And I think that that's worth paying attention to or honoring if that is how you feel. Um, purely in terms of brands and sense terms, um, the stock market has performed much better than the South African rental market um, historically and specifically over the last 16 years, or sorry, uh, like nine, 10 years. Um, so, and also it is obviously much more diversified and safer to put your money into a whole basket of shares. So you're investing in companies all around the world through something like a global ETF, then in making it, locking up all of your capital, all of your money into one single asset um, in one single place connected to one single economy. Um, so it's a bit of a personal question, I guess. If you purely have your math brain, your rands and cents brain, typically if it's a home loan, you versus investing long-term in the share in equities market, equities win. But emotionally for many people, being able to pay off your home loan four or five years earlier is more emotionally beneficial to them. So it's a bit of a personal question. Okay, I am going to take one more tiny quick question. Really cutting into the wire. Um, I really appreciate that you guys have been hanging out here with me. It's really nice. Uh, it gives me a break from talking to my own self in the mirror, which has been very boring. Um, okay, I'm going to take Rand's question. Hi, Sam. I'm also living abroad with a long-term view of moving back to South Africa. Now the currency rate is in our favor. Should I transfer a lump sum to SA now and invest it there? And if yes, where should I put it for the next 10 years or so? Um, again, I'm going to couch that one in. That's a very specific question and probably worth talking to a financial advisor about because it's worthwhile having someone sit down and actually work through your specific goals um, in the situation. Um, generally, though, yeah, I think now is a pretty good time to be shifting money back into South Africa if you can. Um, if you are parking it for at least 10 years, um, it's worth considering using your tax-free savings allowance if you haven't already. That is obviously 36,000 Rand that every South African can invest tax-free in almost anything, any traditional investing vehicle. Um, it's particularly great for topping up retirement savings. It's really good as like a very long-term savings vehicle. Um, even longer than 10 years if you can, because that's where not having to pay interest on all of that growth becomes ah, ah, beautiful. Um, and I'm a, I'm a really simple, straightforward kind of girl. I, if you're investing for 10 years, I'm always a big believer in global ETF. <laughs> very simple. Um, it's low fee. It's very diversified, uh, which makes it much more safe really. Um, many, many, many things have to go wrong before over a long term that won't do well. That's it, guys. Um, I just want to wrap this up with talking a little bit more about solidarity, um, both the fund, but also the concept. Uh, the thing that really strikes me right now about what we're going through is that viruses connect all of us much more than we would like to sometimes. Um, but none of us are going to get through the situation uh, by building lagers, by building moats. Um, I mean, physically, yes, 
But when it comes to the economic reality of what we're going through, um, the more we can support the really vulnerable people in our society, the more likely it is that our economy overall will recover. Um, and that's something that all of us need. Um, so even if you do it only for selfish reasons, um, we all need to do whatever we can to help the people who are going to be affected by this most. Um, and donating to the Solidarity Fund is a great way to do that. Again, there's a little button at the bottom. Please do that. Um, if that's not your jam, uh, Gift of the Givers is also collecting money specifically for uh, healthcare workers on the front lines. Uh, and I also just want to say, like, thank you to all of you uh, who are going into isolation. Um, I think there's something incredibly heroic about what all of us are doing. We're making an enormous sacrifice right now, a, a number of enormous sacrifices, um, and we're doing it to protect each other. And there's something really amazing to me about that. Um, so we're in this together. Um, I know it's a tough time, but you're not alone. And if you have any other questions or thoughts, or if you just want to chat and tell me what's going on in your life, guys, I'm so bored. <laughs> Reach out uh, on Twitter or join the newsletter, um, whatever. It's been really kiff hanging out with you all. And stay safe and stay isolated. Bye.